Hello everyone and welcome first to the Aussie Live series. I'm sure some of you have actually been in sessions prior to this, but it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Gail Lovely. Um, I've been really fortunate to go to the ISTE conferences in the US for the last two years and Gail is one presenter that I actively seek out to attend her sessions. She always has so much to um, share. She's really easy to listen to. You go home with lots of hands-on ideas and activities. So it's wonderful to have Gail as one of our keynote speakers. And Gail works in that wonderful early childhood area where perhaps a lot of us don't have much to do with. So hopefully you can all hear us. And I am going to first of all thank our sponsors and supporters for this conference because without them it would not go ahead. So you can see these sponsors listed on the whiteboard. And we would love you now to indicate where in the world you are from. So if you click on your little select object pointer or the top whiteboard tool, you can click on that, grab one of those smiley faces and drag it to where you live. So we would love to see where everyone is and I'm going to let Gail tell you where she is in a minute because she actually isn't at home. So we all got the opportunity to grab an emoticon and put it on the board. Someone's in for coffee. I guess that's um, Maria, is it? Oh, no, Michael. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm sure you will learn a lot from Gail and Gail, we thank you for giving up your time because Gail is actually not at home but Gail, I'll hand over to you and let you tell everyone where you are but where you are actually from as well. Thanks Gail. Thank you Anne. Yes, um, this is Gail and I'm very happy to be with you. I'm coming to you from cold Anchorage, Alaska, where it's minus 10 degrees Celsius this morning, although I live in Houston, Texas, where it's much warmer. Uh, but I was lucky enough, I'm here for a, a state conference in Alaska, and uh, they were having the world championships of sprint dog sled racing, and I got to go out and watch it this morning. So I've had a really marvelous cultural experience uh, this morning. But I'm happy you're here and um, that we're ready to do some learning about uh, technology and apps in particular for young learners. Um, please feel free to chat along and ask questions. Um, I will have pictures to share later. I will do that. Um, but I'm really happy you're here. So as I was preparing, got to thinking about um, my friends and colleagues like Anne in Australia, and I know many of you are in Australia as well. And so of course, I used an app to help me with that. This is a picture of I Translate Voice, where it was translating for me from American English to Australian English. Um, it was kind of funny. I don't know. I will try to let you hear it. Um, I asked a question of it. And, um, American English, and then it would say back. Let me see if I can get it to go. So, so this is what I said to it, which was um, pretty straightforward. I just said, "Did you make the team?" And the response in Australian was, "I don't know if you were able to hear that, but it said it was a little bit heavier voice, but uh, with intonation, perhaps a little bit of Australia." So we do have these. Um, opportunities for apps. It was a little bit of an Aussie accent, exactly. It does translate to a lot of other languages, but I just thought that would get me going for today. I started in educational technology back when this was the only early childhood um, app or software that um, existed, and it was called Juggles Rainbow, and it literally looked like this. And if a child touched a keyboard, a key on the keyboard, on the top of the keyboard, the top of the rainbow would light up, and if a child touched a key at the bottom of the keyboard, the bottom of the rainbow would light up. And we thought it was brilliant because it was the only thing a non-reader could do. Um, those were the dark ages, and we've come a long way. But with young learners, we've had to struggle, really, with how to help them get beyond the challenges of mouse and keyboard. And the keyboard 
has been a barrier that's really kept the littlest ones from being highly successful. They um, struggle. And of course, we move beyond keyboards to uh, I'm not even <clears throat> the first kind of touch thing, I suppose, is the touch pad that we have on a laptop and how difficult that is for young learners to manipulate. These young ladies were trying very hard to click and drag on the touch pad on this laptop. So that you can see, I think there are something like uh, five hands in there. There was a third person helping as they were just trying to click and drag. But come about three years ago, things started to change. And the touch screen mobile device, the tablet, really has made a huge difference for us with young learners. And it's an opportunity that's new and we've never had before in that we can take a tablet and hand it to a young child, and they almost know how to use it, the interface anyway, right from the start. <clears throat> now, I apologize for this being um, a US survey, but it is um, somewhat interesting. This is from May and June of 2013, and it's asked, talking about children age 0 to 8-year-olds and the different media activities they do at least once a day. And you can see that um, sadly only 60% are read to. But 17% of 0 to 8 year olds in the US last year used a mobile device. Uh, so we're, we're seeing these numbers growing rapidly in a rather rapid fashion. Uh, they don't have any challenge with the interface. What the challenge comes for is when we have, we have to pick good things, you know, um, I think it was Forrest Gump who said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you will get. Um, and the App Store is much like that. In the App Store, everything looks like it will taste good. Uh, when I was a child, I used to poke my finger in the bottom of the chocolates so I wouldn't get the one with coconut. And now, I think the equivalent is, I get a lot of apps, and some of them are not the flavor that I wish they were. So you think, well, maybe one solution is just buy all the apps. And if you were to buy all the apps, this is from last year, but it's a pretty interesting stat. If you bought all the apps in the US iTunes store that were labeled education, you would spend $173,000. And you would be getting 43,000 apps. Uh, that's a pretty crazy amount um, to spend. And sometimes I think we all feel like we've kind of done that. But there are more than 80,000 apps in the um, iTunes store. That's just the US iTunes store um, for apps. Now, if we look at the Australian store, this is the top charts from uh, last week for Australia education. And the shaded blue ones are free apps. And so you see the top 10 free apps in education from Australia, the top 10 paid apps, and then interestingly, the top grossing apps. And you may notice that the fourth top grossing app is a free app because of those um, in-app purchases. So, so there are there's some information here and some data. You should see that the, this is the US one. It's not a lot different. There are a few differences as to what hits the top. Uh, it appears to me that in the US, we fall for the free apps as being top money making um, <laughs> far more frequently than you do in Australia. So those are the, these are the educational top um, of the charts for last year, last week. So given that, how do, how, does, how do we choose? So share in the chat just briefly, how do you come to find apps? How do you choose what to buy and what to get? Let's, I'll give you a couple of uh, 30 seconds, and let's see, what are the apps? How do you find apps? How do you choose? So I see by word of mouth, by other people, by Twitter, on Facebook. Yep, trying free ones first, asking teachers. <laughs> Thanks, Carol, from me. <laughs> Facebook. So we mostly 
from what I'm reading there, most people are referring to, are using other people, not any professional resources, not a not necessarily an app um, evaluator, but from what other people have to say. And I think that that's kind of um, the norm and the natural thing to do. There isn't one right way to select or choose um, apps, but I'm going to go through some guidelines based really on developmental appropriateness uh, for young learners. So uh, I'm basing this off, some work, off of some work from the Fred Rogers Center, and that links there on the slide. Um, but these are some kind of the guidelines for how technology should be handled. And the first one, of course, is that it should be interactive. Uh, I am not a supporter of using technology in passive mode, and that if we're going to be using technology in educational settings, uh, we need to be looking for interaction. So it's not passive viewing as something, it's really the interactive piece. Now when you think about that, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because we know young learners are never really passive, but we're looking at things that look more like this, where the children are actively doing and thinking and being. Now, in some cases, the app itself is not what's interactive. These are screenshots from an app called Photopedia Heritage, and it has amazing images of um, World Heritage Sites, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, all around the world. So think about these images. If you have these kinds of incredible, rich images, the kinds of conversations you can have with children, the words and the vocabulary development, the idea sharing, the writing, all of those things. So the interactivity comes from our discussions, our what they're saying about them, what they do, come up and trace it with their finger, follow those lines, working on whole body responses. So while the app isn't really an interactive piece, it's really about what we do with it. The other apps are totally about interaction. So this one is for very, very young children, Sego Mini Soundbox. And the first picture with all the icons, that's just showing the menu. But once you choose a menu, you'll get all these little balls start appearing. And if you move your, your iPad and tilt it one way or another, well, then they bounce into each other and make their sounds. And it makes a really interactive, engaging, both visual and motor and auditory interaction tool. Um, and the range of sounds is nice because it's everything from xylophones and chimes to dogs and animals and farmyards and so and trucks and cars. So it's a very rich auditory um, opportunity for young people. And the interactivity is built into the app. If you do nothing, it will do nothing. So when we think about interactivity, we'll look at both of those as the way we look at interactive. One of the other things that comes out of the Fred Rogers Center is to really be looking at use and matching that with age and, and thinking about that. We would never give a very extensive dictionary to this toddler, like in this picture, that if you really want to um, think about it, that's a really good way to think about this, is kind of how do you tailor it. So I have a book I'm writing with a colleague. It's coming out soon called Using an iPad with Your Preschooler, and it's designed for parents. And in some thinking about parents, we broke down the development into these um, categories. And the first one, this one with the big uh, blue hand here, this one is, is really about uh, slappers. Those are children who don't have much more developmental eye-hand coordination other than slapping at something. So they, they can move a foot or a hand, and they just slap. And that's what that blue one is. And there are some apps that are appropriate for that development level. The next one next to that is that red finger, and those are the pointers. And it's interesting that pointers may not even touch the screen at first. We see more and more little kids who will just point at something because they're used to doing that, and then they suddenly touch it. And now they're not only pointing, but they're tapping. And so that's the next one, which is the pointers and tappers. 
And the yellow one at the bottom of the screen are the ones who can actually drag. And at first, draggers, it's more like scribbling. And kids give a crayon, and they're scribbling on the paper. And they don't really have good control about when they pick it up off the paper and when they put it back down. So they're really doing dragging, but not a lot of control. So those are the first three uh, levels. And then we talk about more precise uh, dragging, and that would be kids who can actually write or draw. And that's that purple hand you may see on the screen now. And finally, we get kids who are very much more precise, and they can actually do some beginning typing. It is on purpose that we show two hands with one finger from each hand. You know, don't find much research that backs for very young children trying to teach them appropriate keyboarding, especially on a touch screen device. But we do want children to use both hands. So we're really working with um, teachers and parents and others to be thinking about and be more thoughtful about having kids use both hands to do that kind of level of development. So we think about those levels as we look at apps as well. So we see apps like this one. This happens to be a xylophone app. And um, a, a slapper probably could use it a little bit by hitting it. Um, and a more precise child could actually touch certain colors and get those sounds or touch those and, and hear those sounds. And even a dragger could do that. If you look closely across the top, um, you'll see there's some little shattered icons. Those actually lead you through actually tapping out a tune. So know that those are those. This is an app that kind of adjusts for different levels of development. The question about thumbs: um, certainly, we'd rather have kids use two thumbs, one from each hand, than just one hand. Uh, on a small, on a tablet like an iPad, yes, we have the split um, keyboard. That's easy to do, um, and we do see that we use more and more. But with real little ones, we use just the whole screen. Uncolor is another app that's appropriate for those kids who are just getting started. And literally, it's a dark screen. And as they move their finger around, it starts erasing the front layer so they can see the picture behind. They're uncoloring it. They don't have to stay behind in any lines. I'm not a huge fan of coloring books. But this is for those very young learners who are just learning to cause an effect um, and do those kinds of things. We were working with some special needs children, and they were also using this as a way to start with writing letters and shapes to see what was underneath. Um, so it's just a simple app called Uncolor, but it's really good for that developmental level. One of my current favorite apps out there is DoodleCast. And these screenshots of DoodleCast only give you a little bit of a picture of what this does. Um, if you look at that bottom right uh, thing, that's a child clearly who's not doing much more than scribbling, although scribbling with some intention. Um, but it's hard for you and I to know what that was a picture of. Well, what's cool about DoodleCast is, is once the child starts the drawing, it's recording the sound as well. So we can actually hear as it's being drawn what the child has to say about it. So if they're saying, over here is my dog, and this is my cat, and here's where this is, we can actually hear that and see it as they draw it so that we actually know what they were thinking or what we were talking to them about as they were doing that drawing. The picture right above that, that orange scribble is uh, a picture of a plate. This does, DoodleCast does have some templates uh, built in, and this one said what's on the plate. And the child drew that. And you might not have known that that was spaghetti pasta and a pumpkin pie. But because the child actually told us that as he drew it, we have it as the product out of DoodleCast that his narration of it. So we have his thinking. And then the, the last picture there were two children who were telling a whole story about going to the grocery store and what they were buying. And that was their picture. And it was actually two little girls working together. And what's nice about when they're working together is then they have a bigger conversation about what they're doing. And all of that gets recorded into DoodleCast. Um, those DoodleCasts can be emailed. Um, there's a link emailed to um, share those, which is nice as well. But that, that developmental 
sequence makes sense in a product like DoodleCast allows us to do that with all those different developmental stages of kids. One of my favorite apps is Book Creator. It is a um, tool that can be used with young children, but also we adults can use it as well. That top right screenshot shows you the kinds of things we can add to each page of our book. So we can have photos. Um, we can take things directly from the camera. So we can have video. Um, we can add text, and we can add sound. And then it makes us really brilliant, beautiful picture books with pictures and, and all of that. And it's very, very easy. I know that Carol Titleman has a session right after this on ePortfolios, and I'm sure she'll talk about Book Creator. It is one of the tools that we're using in some of the schools I work that with um, as a tool for ePortfolios as well. But this kind of very simple tool um, makes sense. So we looked at, in this section, kind of this range of physical development from slappers to typers. And we looked at uh, Book Creator, DoodleCast, Uncolor, and a xylophone. Does anyone else have a favorite app that kind of fits in similar to any of these? You want to share those in the chat? I'll be quiet for just a moment and see. Book Creator is, is uh, $4.99 in the U.S., $4.99. Any other apps anyone wants to share before we move on? iBook Author is also a good one, Peggy. This one's just a little bit more simplistic, so it makes it a little bit easier to get started with. Um, Singing Fingers is another one for those young beginners. Good idea, Carol. Um, one of the nice things about Book Creator is what it outputs to is an EPUB. Uh, yes, Creative Book Builder is kind of the next step, I agree. So that's a good question um, about how much of the day would I recommend using apps in a preschool class. Uh, my response to be, that would be, as it seems to fit. Um, so that that's kind of sounds like a non-answer, but the reality is like saying, how much of the day do we use crayons, or how much of the day do, do we use paints? Uh, I think we have to see how it fits. And we'll come back around to that. That's a good question. So I'm going to move on a little bit more. And, and uh, it seems obvious that we need to be thinking about developmentally appropriate content. And I'm not by here meaning that it's something that would be bad for children to see. But does it really meet the needs, the instructional or developmentally content appropriate needs? And this sometimes surprises us. It is. Um, I still, even last week, saw an app that came out recently that got some good reviews that had a misspelled word on the title screen. Uh, and I'm not willing to put that in front of children. So we have to be really watchful. Here's another example of that kind of problem. So this is a non-example. I don't put the app name here because I don't want you to get it. But I love the graphics. I thought it was really cute um, until I looked at N is for nest, and or is it for knitting? And since it really was about the letter and not just the sound, uh, that's somewhat problematic. The one on the right, where it has F, um, F, I've never shown it to a child whose first response was flower. It's, they usually say rain. Now, the gifted kids or the sharp kids who have lots of vocabulary might say flower or falling, but very rarely um, does it, do they get it quite right. So it's not a good choice because kids are going to use the apps that we work 
confused with them independently at times. And to be having to unteach the teaching is probably not a good idea. Um, I look at that in my thought reign as well. So uh, it's, we just have to be careful. We have to be really vigilant. The other thing to be watching for are apps that really help us do a job we already are doing, or maybe even improve on it. So Letter Schools is an app for helping children learn to form letters. And the reason I, I bring Letter School as an example is it does such an excellent job of scaffolding for children. So if the child touches the letter R, um, it says R is for robot. It has a little robot in this case. And then where is the number two? This is, is a screenshot of the first level, the introduction. And literally, the children tap to see the letter formed in the order that it is formed. And then the second level, they actually trace that. And the third, they write that kind of in a scaffolded um, way. The thing that's nice about this is, if you're in a classroom, it's really hard to monitor how children are forming the letters. Are they starting at the bottom and they're supposed to start at the top? Uh, are they writing them upside down and then turning the paper around? Uh, how are they actually forming them? And this app has a room for a little margin of error, but not a lot. And so we really have to stop and look and see, does this provide good guided practice without another human being necessarily doing that? And I think that's really important. So you would have to, if you were interested in an app for this kind of um, work, make sure that it forms the letters the way you teach children to form them, of course. Um, but this is my favorite of the many that are out there because it does such a great job of offering many levels of scaffolding. When children have gone through all the levels of the letters, there's a whole other second tier of practice as well. So very um, powerful scaffolding possibilities. Uh, a little bit more challenging, perhaps, is supporting children who are still struggling to write their form their letters, uh, but are ready a little bit older, so they're writing words. And this is my favorite from that kind of collection. It's called Write My Name. And um, the example I've shown you here on the right is a custom tag. Um, so we're, on the left, you'll see the menu. It says My Name Tags. And so I made this tag. Uh, with a picture of my dog, Bo. And um, you can see that that's a work in progress, a screenshot of a work in progress, where it said the word Bo, because it recorded me saying that. There's a picture of Bo, and then the letters are grayed out at the bottom, and the child is working to write those letters as close to the um, perfect writing as they can. It actually uh, keeps that, and when they're done writing the word, up in the top corner there's a little picture of a camera and they can save that and it time and date stamps that for them. Uh, so this is a real good way of building some evidence of their handwriting and how they're doing on their own. Question about when do children begin writing? Well that of course is a, a huge um, debate of course. I, I, I tend to come from the world where children want to write then we should help them write. Um, and we should help them form them in a way that makes sense because how we do things first is um, often the way we continue to do things. So these are pretty good scaffolds for that. Um, as far as stylus or finger, uh, Montessori schools would probably say uh, you let them write with a finger in, in shaving cream and on a tablet and everywhere else. Um, I think that's totally a free choice. In the schools I work with, um, where there's like a center, they tend to have some styluses sitting there. Um, and some children choose a stylus, and some choose, uh, choose their fingers. Depends on what we're working on. In places where children are struggling with holding the pencil and doing that well, then we want them to use a stylus to work on that. Um, but for some kids, that's too many things to think about at once. So it just, I think, depends on the child and your philosophy. But once again, this is the kind of thing that scaffolds and supports the child um, at the same um, kind of level that we would like to be able to do that. This app um, also provides books. The alphabet book has alphabet, but also words. And I think that's important, too, because we really want kids to get beyond single letters. 
Here's another app I wanted to bring up. This is Cold Dark Night by Collins Big Cat Books. It's free. Um, but what I'm showing you here, I'm sorry to say I forgot I had layered this slide, so you're not going to see the other pieces of it. But there's a, a, it's a children's book. And it has this little drawn illustration, this, this little hedgehog guy. And he's looking for a home. And it's all done in illustration. And, and when you're reading the book, it can be read to you. Or you can um, record yourself reading it. So now what we have is a book of scaffolding fluent reading, because we can listen to how someone else has read the book, and then we can read it ourselves and record that. But then at the very end of the book, we can also create our own book. And we can build it. These are the tools to build it with. What's kind of nice about that, though, is it includes both illustrations from the book, but also photographs of those animals. So we're pairing the nonfiction animal with the fictional animal in the text. And children can make the book with those photographs or with the illustrations. And I think it's also important to note I am um, very hesitant, or very, that's not the right word, very cautious about how I choose electronic books for young learners. Um, if it highlights the words, I think that's a good thing. There's some very early research out um, from the Joan Coons, Joan Kinney, Joan, <laughs> I can't remember it. Oh, Peggy George will probably know. Joan Cooney Gantz Center, there it is, uh, about e-reading in e-books. And what they found is, is that children who sit on their parents' lap and read an e-book with their parents, and the e-book highlights the words, they have better um, book sense than children who sit on the lap with their parent and the parent reads them a regular book. So that highlighting the words gives the kids that sense, even way before they're able to read, about how books work and how language, written language works. It's a very small study, so it's still very early. But I think we always want to be cautious that we're looking at apps for books um, and making sure that the animation and the things that happen on the screen would support the story or support the book, the book as opposed to abstract from that. Uh, it's just like we play with a book. But I think, but I think um, um, it needs to be, it needs to be context, context there. I'll turn, I'll turn off and I can turn it off. Yeah, sorry, Carol. It's just a little bit garbled. Car uh, Carol, do you think that's the best thing to try? Yeah, I think it's because you're so far away and it's freezing over there. It's minus 10 degrees. <laughs> try again, please, Gail. I turn it on and on and on and on and better. No, it's still garbled to me, unfortunately. Um, I, I perhaps just try once more, switch it off again, and maybe just wait and see if it catches up. Um, it, perhaps it's snowing now, Gail. OK, let's try again. OK, I'm back. Is that any better? No, we've still got the garbling. Carol, I don't know. Should Gal go out and come back in again, or what do you think? Oh, Gail, Shambles is saying, just unplug your headset. Do you have a microphone external, or is it just on your laptop? Let's see. It's better. I think that's better now, Gail. Just try. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, that's much better. Again. Yay! Peggy George likes the wonderful storybooks. Those are good. Thank you. I'm glad you told me I was garbled. So ebooks, we have to be careful. Be really careful. If, if you just want to, pl not just, if you're just playing with language, then it's fine if it's, it's very entertaining and um, fun. We want to be careful if it's all about touch, 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 touch the picture, and the things we're touching in the picture really aren't about the story, versus if we're um, doing a book where it really is about the story. And so 
find that balancing point or make sure you include a mix. I highly recommend looking at the Collins Big Cat books. There are about eight of them, and they're free in the U.S. Um, iTunes store. But there are others as well. So be looking for books where the focus is still on the language and the story or the content. We also need to be looking at apps and decide based on what our environment is, what the, what the intention is about how that app will be used. Some things are just best done, one child and one device. Other things are way better if we do them in small groups or together with a partner or if we do something and then pass it to the person next to us. So we need to be looking at that. So many classrooms have one or two or a few more tablets. Very few early learning uh, places I go have one-to-one -one tablets with very young children. But in any case, I think there are times when we work together and there are times when we work on our own. And we need to look at apps and see if they're designed well for those different kinds of settings. We do see some apps that are designed intentionally for multiple children to use at the same time. On this um, screen, you're seeing one called Futaba Classroom Games. Uh, and in this case, I was working with some children who were um, uh, in the kind of the autistic syndrome, um, and, and they didn't spend a lot of time looking at each other in the face. And so what happened was we were helping them learn each other's names, to read each other's names, and they have to look at each other to know who it was. The way this software, this app works is what's in the middle is what spins around. When it stops, you're supposed to touch the answer. And in this case, the answer is somebody's um, name. What's cool about the uh, Futaba Classroom Games is that there are, um, it's limitless what you can create because you can, you can add your own content. So the thing that spins in the middle could be shapes of um, states of the U.S. or provinces of Canada or whatever it is, and you'd see the outline, and then you would have put in the options at the bottom, and children is a game, and it can earn points. But all of this is happening on one iPad. It's set up for from one to four children to do simultaneously. It could be, by the way, for working with older kids, it could be a formula or something from the table of the elements. Um, it could be a lot of different things. And even for foreign language kids, it could be our kids who have more than one language, it could be a photograph of something, and then the words to choose from are the word for that. So it's very open-ended, but it's designed for multiple children to use the same tablet at the same time. Here's another one that's designed like that. This is one called Jelly Bean Camp. In this case, there are the four buckets, the four colors, uh, and in the middle there are always ten jelly beans. And you have to hold down so there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five green ones. You would need to put five fingers simultaneously into the green paint in the corner to represent the five green jelly beans, and one in the red and two in the purple. Uh, and there's two modes for this. And in multiplayer mode, those all have to be held down simultaneously, which is really a good cooperative, collaborative project for little ones to do to get all those fingers in the right colors at the right time to um, get the answer right. But it's obviously designed for more than um, one child to do uh, in a very collaborative, not competition way. So if competition's an issue, this one's more about working together. Another thing really is to look at um, this whole idea about engagement and fun. I do believe fun's important. I think sometimes, at least here in the U.S., we've gotten away from fun. Um, and I think fun is really, really important. Uh, I see there's a good discussion going on in chat, and let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, airplay and projecting things. Um, so here's, here's the cautionary tale. We can have whatever's on an iPad displayed. Um, on a big screen, be that a big screen, an interactive whiteboard, or a big TV, or a big um, the wall, or whatever. It can all be displayed, and we can. There are lots of ways to do that. But the caution is, is we can all watch them, but we're not all doing. 
we have to be really a little more clever as teachers then because the people using the iPad are doing the actual physical interaction and the rest of us are just watching. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, but there are some, some really powerful things we can do with that. I'm certainly not discounting the fact that we could do that and have a conversation. We can do guess and check and we can say what should the, our, our iPads, our tablet controllers do now because the group make that decision. Uh, but the only ones who are physically interacting with the device are the ones who are making things change on the wall. I hope that makes sense. Um, and reflection is an app that you put on your uh, desktop or your laptop that does that. It uses AirPlay, so they all both have to be on the same um, wireless network. Uh, there, there are others as well. Uh, Apple TV is another one, but all of those are wireless network uh, dependent, so just know that that's an issue. Of course, you can also have a little dongle, a little cable that comes off of your tablet and plug it directly into a VGA or an HDMI and you can display it directly from the tablet as well. So there are lots of ways to make that happen. But it's all network dependent and you have to make sure where you're doing it that they will allow it. In, for example, in a hotel, like I'm in a hotel now, I almost never can use them because they almost always block those as streaming video. So just know that. Here's another one of these um, apps that I think are just incredibly fun, um, incredibly engaging, and really do help kids to use some of the things that we don't let them use as much in the classroom sometimes. This is called Monster Music. And uh, what you're seeing here on the screen is at the top in those black and gray shaded area uh, is like the staff, the musical staff. I think that's what's called musical staff. And then those little monsters are are playing different notes or different instruments and I place them on the staff and then the, the horizontal, the vertical line goes across and plays them and I make music. Um, there are four different sets of um, monsters, like the one you're seeing here is classical, so it's like a cello uh, or a bass and uh, they're different, different kinds of instruments. So you get to actually make some pretty interesting music. So very easy, fun way to play with uh, Music beginning of music and sound. Uh, the one that looks a little bit like a target is actually gets to record their own voice or their own sound. So that's kind of fun for them too. But it's a very engaging, very uh, fun opportunity to play with listening to sound and order and patterning and all those things that we don't do a lot of in the classroom yet. We know the research shows us is important. So. Um, I would look for apps that are like that as well. I will tell you, more giggles per minute with this one than a lot of other apps. We also need to be thinking about and promoting digital literacy. And um, this little guy was out with this interesting iPad case, the iGuy from Spec, and he was taking pictures. And we talked about this is kind of the progression for taking pictures of our digital literacy and our digital citizenship and thinking through that first we just have children take pictures and then we teach them about asking for permission to take pictures um, and that, you know, we can take pictures but if we're going to use them maybe we should ask if it's all right to use them or we might even ask some people before we take the pictures. And then we need to choose wisely which ones tell the story or make the um, would help someone understand what was happening or whatever our criteria is, and then finally where and how to share those. And we're starting with children as young as three and four in some of the schools I'm working with, and they are documenting their lives at school um, in this way. So one of the schools I'm working with in their um, first grade, which is uh, six-year-olds primarily, five and six, uh, they have every day somebody is the um, historian and they get to take as many as um, 15 to 20 pictures is the most they're supposed to take because the first week the teacher learned they take too many and then in the last 15 minutes of the day they choose they share three with the rest of the class and the class as a whole decides which one will go in the class blog and the child puts that one on the blog 
Well, the higher level thinking and the decision making then about how, which 15 to take, which three to show to your class, and how do you make a decision about that um, is really powerful. And who's their audience? Their parents and each other. Uh, the teacher says her blog traffic has gone up considerably since she started this process because the kids go home and say, yeah, I voted for this or I voted for that and this is what we have. And um, they're just now starting to add uh, text to go to those images on their blog. So they're doing it as a class. So this is a first year tablet school. The first grade only has three tablets in their classrooms, but it's a place to start, but the children are really taking very seriously this progression of digital citizenship. How do they go from place to place, from level to level of the responsibilities? So since in this classroom they wanted to share, I think one of the big things that we have to start looking at is what happens to the work? What happens after a child makes something? Uh, where does the file go? Where does the work go? How, do, how, does it, how do we have it have audience? How do we give the children voice? Uh, it's really, really important. And we need to start uh, thinking more about that. The, um, the example I just gave about the class historian and the posting of those pictures on a daily basis I asked the teacher how much time, extra time did it take her? Um, and she said, well, you know, at first it took me a little bit of time, but she said what I realized was our day was ending so much better because they demanded that we had this time to look at the three pictures and choose. And she said that we finished the day every day with something positive and that it really was worth the amount of time it took. And I said, okay, well, that's valid really valid, but how much time did it take you? And she said, oh, it doesn't take me any time. And so what do you mean? She says, well, I don't take the pictures. I don't make the decisions. The voting, now that we have it down that you only get to share three, takes us five minutes. And the child who's the historian posts it. And she says, I just, it just goes. I don't have to worry about it. And I said, well, what's the benefit? And she said, the benefit is parents are so happy because for the first time the kid parents, and she said it this way, I'm not going to say I said it, but I totally related to it. The parents of some of the boys said the first time they could point to something and say to their child, their son, I saw this picture of whatever it was, tell me about that. And they actually heard about what happened that day from their, their son when their son normally would never have anything to say. How was school? Fine. What did you learn? Nothing. What did you do? Nothing. But now there was video, there was still image, there was video, or video, she was starting video next week, of what actually happened and the conversations changed. Uh, in this one classroom, there was one child whose parents did not allow um, them to be in any pictures that were posted online. In that classroom, what she's done is she mostly allows that child to be the photographer and others are the editors. So that the child's being the photographer, they're not in the images. Uh, we think that probably over time, that will change uh, and really help parents see that this is not a, a threatening thing, but there's a lot of uh, worry uh, by American parents about things like that. But this file management is going to be the key, the key to everything, I think. Uh, in the old days, we used to have floppy disks that really were floppy. And um, kids had their own floppy disk, and they saved to their floppy disk. And um, the child was in charge of keeping track of their floppy disk. And now, <laughs> boy, some apps still use that as the icon for saving, and kids have no idea why. But now we also put all the iPads or tablets in a school in matching cases, and then we expect them to be able to find their work again. And it's really becoming an issue. Uh, in a non-one-to-one -one school setting. So we're beginning to really think about how do kids get back to their work and how do kids find their work and how do we find their work and how do we organize that and move them on. 
So we began to look for apps that help us with that. Now, some of you, I know Peggy probably has heard me, I know Ann has too. My favorite app in all the apps in all the app stores I've ever been to is still Explain Everything. It's a $2.99 app in the iTunes store. It's also available for Android. Um, it is incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. But this screenshot is part of why I think it's so, so special. Um, a child's working on this app, which includes things like um, you can put shapes and you can draw and you can add images and you can have voiceovers and you can do animations. And by the way, you can have a live website, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go to save, look at all the options I have here. Across the top, I can save my project as a video file, as a PDF file, as an image file. I can save it as a project, which means I can move from one tablet to another and keep editing it. And then across the bottom, you'll see all the places where I can save that, save it to my camera roll. I can save it to iTunes, I can save it to Dropbox or Evernote or Google Drive or Box. There's some others hidden on there as well. So this is an app that understands that the control of the work and the sharing of the work is critically important. Critically important. Uh, what is um, maybe not so obvious to all of us is that while we think this is going to be important for us as older people, it's really important for young ones as well. This looks like an awful lot. There's a lot of tools down the left, and there's tools across the bottom. Uh, we're using it in kindergarten with five, four and five, five and six-year-olds, and they're making their own portfolios using it uh, because we don't have to use all those tools every time. So we want to begin to pay more attention to where this share square leads them. This, this icon, this we call the share square, uh, that's a child-friendly term. The share square is incredibly important. Uh, for the first time two weeks ago, I had a child tell me that they wanted to use the share square to put something in their own Dropbox account. Their dad had made the phone. So uh, it's, it's starting to happen already that so we really are seeing um, those kinds of things change. But that putting things and be able to control the movement of work and information is important. In the slides, I've given you some four links to teachers uh, who, are, who are doing the work. The first two is that one's a kindergarten teacher and one's a first grade teacher. And they are in their first year with iPads. And I think it's valuable to see what they have to share and what they're doing um, in their classrooms. They do not have one-to-one. -one. The kindergarten classroom has six. And the first grade classroom, I think, will have four starting next week. They've had three. And then there are a couple down below that have more experience. We've been using uh, tablets for a much longer time in their classrooms so that you can actually go in and explore and see what they're sharing um, on an ongoing basis about kind of uh, some powerful, powerful ways to learn from each other and to gather that information. They are um, teachers who are full-time in their classrooms as we speak. They don't have the luxury that I do of being everywhere. Thanks for sharing those links in the chat, people. Um, as I mentioned, I have a book coming up very soon. It's almost done. It's for parents, so that's yeah, well, thank you my so little much for sharing all your Making us think about, think about um, where we start and how we together start to learn and how we can improve um, learning, especially for the little ones. But I found well, so yeah. much, and I'm sure I can adapt across to the older students that I teach. And now I'm not sure whether there are any questions in the chat or does someone want to grab the microphone and ask a question? If not, just quickly put your questions in the chat because I'm sure Gail will be quite happy to answer them. While people are putting them in the chat, please, 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 I do want to um, kind of uh, 
echo what you just said, Anne, which is it's very clear that how you first do something is is how you're more likely to continue to do something. So how we use technologies and tablets with young ones will inform and influence what happens thereafter. So I think it is really important to be thoughtful um, and precise about the choices book, we make and how we when use the technology get published to you have a because day it day. will inform and form how they use them going forward. Um, it will be very soon. There's a, a form on suddenly at clicks.com where you can sign up and you'll get notified. It's going to gone to copy editor number one this week. So we're very close now. Percentage per day per app use. Um, uh, I, I think that I would prefer to see uh, tablets used integrated into the things we do as opposed to being tablet time. Uh, and so it, that kind of means different things in different settings. So if, if your teacher uses centers, you might sometimes it might make sense to have tablet or tablets in the math center. Yeah, it and other times it might make yeah. sense to have it in the stories yes, center. Or, right. um, so it kind of changes. But uh, with children who are seven and under, I think almost all of that time will be in pairs at least so that it's not isolated use. Voice to text. Uh, it's a really good, yeah, it's a good question. So far, most of the voice to text tools don't handle children's voices very well, and it can be extremely frustrating for them. So what I, I find as, as Many of the schools and the teachers I work with, what we're doing is using audio recordings instead of the text, and then either have, helping the child transcribe the text later, or having older children do that transcription as a way of helping them listen and write, so that we kind of double dip. Um, that can be helpful as well. Uh, Peggy asked about LiveScribe pens. Uh, I have used LiveScribe pens, but there's an app called Audio Note which is exactly like an I, a live scribe pen, and um, I actually like it better. Another question. Yeah, well, thank you well, so much. I have to take this time after the time we've had together. It's always amazing. We're looking for something specific in the other end of the world. Six hundred and eighty students. I'm just going to share a little bit of an alcoholic. You know, all of us in this room. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Shambles is just asking, can we put the PowerPoint on our slide sheet? So I'm sure he will contact you, Gail. Just to let you know, though, we're going from the very young to the senior citizens now, if you're interested. So we've got a session called um, Age versus, sorry, I've given you the link to Carol's in there. So if you want to go to Carol's, interesting session on how, what is it, um, creating dazzling e-portfolios, which I think is an essential for us all. That's the link that just went into the chat. This one coming in now is if you would like to hear about technology and the older people and how that works. So I'll just drop that in here. So you can save the chat if you would like to keep the links, etc. Um, so you go to File, Save, Chat and save it as text. And then don't forget that first link I shared is for Carol's Creating Dazzling ePortfolios. Thank you again, Gail. Um, I don't know what time of day it would be there. Is it night time or is it early morning? I can't think. No, it would be night time, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's 5 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but is it five o'clock like in the afternoon on Friday or are you five AM Saturday? No, it's five PM Friday evening. Okay. Well Saturday is looking good here in Australia, so I hope you enjoy your Saturday as well. Um Chris has put his information there if you're willing to share your slide share. This will also be recorded and the recording will be made available to people to watch 
after this session. And we would just like you all to exit. You can get um, certificates, I think. I don't know if the details are there. And we've got these great badges if you would like to share them on your website. Thanks again, Gail. And when you are ready, we will close the room and you can exit. Thank you.